Hi, everyone. It is July 1, July 1, 2021. How are you doing, everyone? How are you doing, my subscribers who live in Washington, Oregon, California, uh, BC, Alberta? It's pretty friggin' hot. Oh, uh, New York and Massachusetts and a whole lot of eastern states, this heat wave. It's dragging on, isn't it? Hotter than hell in eastern Montana right now. And that was just a few hours ago. What is it here? Let's see. I had um, captured some temperatures last night at 6.15 p.m. It was 106 here. It's hot. It's hot. And as this heat wave continues to just go on and on and on, well, boy, don't you feel like your energy is just being zapped? 85, 11 p.m. last night, 85. Now, the lows were, it, it was really quite amazing looking at the lows. Now, did I just, I guess, the lows changed. It was 67 when I saw this uh, sometime yesterday in the afternoon. And I thought, wow, you know, that it was close to a 40 degree drop. But here the low is 70 and it's 85 at 11 p.m. Okie dokie. Well, 93 at 12 p.m. today. The temperature has increased significantly and quickly 101 at 2 p.m. Now I must not have captured an 85 that I saw and it was only about an hour before well it was at the 11 p.m. at 11 a.m. which was 85 and I thought okay 93 and 8 degree increase in one hour. You're just going to have to trust me on it because I clearly failed to capture it. Um, 101, 2 p.m. And now it's 103. Yeah, excessive heat warning. Okay, so I know that a lot of you are really having difficulty with this and just have to bear it, I guess, right? All right, fires, flooding, mudslides, let's get into it. I laid down for a nap. I thought everything was fine. I got up and the flames were kind of right at the end of the street and the road is blocked off right at the end of my street. And I just thought, you know, I, that's it. I can't, I can't sleep. My thing is get my guitars, get my drums and photos of my kids and get out. So I just packed up and left last night. Now, Strongheart lives right here next to the Weed High School where that incident staging area has been currently set up for the lava fire. She says that she did return to the area today where she was to get some more instruments and some more pictures of her family, but says that again that she will be leaving the area later today. Again, she, she says she just doesn't feel safe right now with the fire burning so close to her home. Now she has No evacuations yet in this area where the lava fire, fire is... Um, Ongoing, 17,000 acres, it's burned already, and latest I heard, 19% contained. Okay. Um. Firefighters are battling several big wildfires across Northern California. This is a time lapse of the Salt Fire in Shasta County, north of Redding. It started yesterday, and this video shows you how quickly it spread. 
This one has burned at least 1,000 acres. Evacu evacuations are in effect for residents on several roads in the area, and there are also road closures along I-5. Let's take a look at some new images from the lava fire in nearby Siskiyou County. This one's near Mount Shasta. And the fire is now more than 17,000 acres. It's 19% contained, and it ignited over the weekend. Evacuations are in place here as well. And this morning, Union Pacific Railroad says that a part of a rail line and bridge are damaged due to this fire. And take a look at this time lapse. This one is of the Dada fire in Plumas County. This is the fire over the last six hours. It all started last night, and it's at least 150 acres this morning. There's zero containment right now. So far, officials have not ordered evacuations. Well, that's what's breaking or happening. Breaking. Well, here we go. Lytton, B.C. We begin tonight with breaking news. The B.C. village that has earned a reputation as the hotspot in North America for the past three days has been evacuated as fire rips through the community. We begin our coverage with Julia Foy. This way, fast. Let's get out of here. It happened in minutes. Fire raced through the village of Lytton, and a thousand residents have had to flee for their lives. I could see buildings on fire, but it was mostly just black. But I could tell how, how close it was to where I was at the gas station that the town had to be gone. And they were in the process of evacuating the gas station when I was there. The village of Lytton had been surrounded by two significant wildfires for the better part of the week. But it was a new fire that erupted late Wednesday afternoon that forced an emergency evacuation. The thing that was going through my mind was not just panic, but let's get everybody out, let's get out of here, let's knock on the neighbor's doors and let's just go. It didn't, there was no time to really think. You just had to just pack, get your stuff in your vehicles, check your neighbors and go. Our landlord just comes busting in our door and he's like, you guys, you guys, you guys need to get your stuff together, you need to go now. And if he didn't come 15, 20 minutes later, we would have been in the house caught on fire. Residents were told to head for safer ground, first to Spence's Bridge, but a power outage forced evacuees to move again to Merritt. The fire service say this blaze moved with tremendous speed, aggravated by strong winds and temperatures that have been record-breaking all week. Whatever started it, um, it spread very, very quickly, and uh, people needed to, to move out of the way as quickly as they could. So, so no, you normally our process would be an alert and then people could get ready, uh, but this one was uh, much faster than that. In 15 minutes, we had to load up the truck, get everything in, get the pets in. We were gone. The fire was within 100 meters of the house. Global News has confirmed that at least 10 homes, the ambulance station, and much of the main street has been destroyed. The community is brokenhearted. It's hard because, I mean, obviously I lost my house and everything, but I'm also worried about everyone else who's displaced, and I feel a little helpless because everybody's, some people are going Chilliwack, some people are going Merritt, some people are here in Lillooet. It's just, it's a disaster. Julia Foy, Global News. And our crews spoke to a few residents who managed to escape the flames and make their way to an evacuation center set up in Merritt. How long did you have to get out? Once? Well, uh, ten minutes and I couldn't see where I was going. I had to stop and wait for a break so the smoke would clear out and uh, I just got out that way. Yeah, that was bad. Yeah, it was bad. It was it went off just like a bomb. Her daughter heard from a lady there. The ambulance center is gone. The medical center, the whole main street is pretty well toast. It's gone. So we don't have a whole heck of a lot to go back to. Jackie Taggart, MLA for Fraser Nicola Region, tweeted out this tonight. Hearing reports of catastrophic damage to the town of Lytton, praying everyone has made it out safely. I'm waiting for a briefing from BC Wildfire Service and will share new information as it's made available. Please follow at BC Gov Fire Info for the latest info and stay safe. Okay, well, I have to say, you know, the, uh, the news that I have been seeing on California, oh... 
planning for major wildfires this this year. I hope all of you are really prepared to just up and leave. So this heat wave is really pretty unbearable. This week, but it, that is not the case for a lot of people. And so it's no surprise that uh, HVAC companies are having their phones like basically ring off the hook this week. This has been a really hot June, as you know, and calls for service and air conditioning repairs are pouring in at McFarland Energy in Dedham. They tell us they're getting on average about 250 requests a day at each of their three locations. But scheduling repair work is just part of the problem because there's no guarantee anyone will have the replacement parts or an AC unit that you may need? I think it's all pandemic related. Um, the parts, just like our vehicles with the computer chips, it also affects our air conditioning systems, our heating systems, anywhere from a motor to a simple thermostat. Out in California, there's a lot of air conditioning units that get shipped in from out of country, and they're sitting there on the docks not being able to be distributed because of the shortage of drivers. Yeah, so McFarland luckily stocked up on AC units last spring. They were anticipating supply and distribution issues, but uh, they're still being forced to scramble for very specific parts for a lot of older models. A lot of people do have older model uh, AC units. Coming up uh, at 5, we're going to have... That's Northeast. That's Boston. Supply chain disruptions are getting worse. You know, and I was amazed when I had to go to Kalispell to do some shopping and... Wow. Shelves. Well, Walmart had no fans. Target had one fan. And they were out of so much. So I don't know if any of you are experiencing that, but Americans are not used to not being able to get whatever it is that they want. So not only do you, you know, not only are you frustrated in that you can't get things, but there's a, there's a, there's a not great energy um, that I'm picking up on when I'm out and about. I'm, any of you experiencing the same thing? So, thousands of New Yorkers lose power on day four of heat wave. Thousands of New Yorkers are sweating it out tonight after losing power in the heat wave. Con Ed and the mayor pleading for people that could serve energy. CBS 2's Ali Bauman live in Times Square right now. Ali. Well, Maurice and Jessica, Con Edison crews are all hands on deck tonight trying to restore power as quickly as possible. But City Hall and Con Ed are pleading with people to lower their AC and not use appliances like dishwashers and microwaves to avoid even bigger outages. Some New Yorkers tried to beat the heat at Coney Island or misting stations in Flushing Meadows, but in Brownsville, Brooklyn. This is what we're working with. The lights are off and elevators out of service at this six-story apartment building. There's no air conditions. We're burning up. I mean, it's ridiculous. This is really bad. It's like, oh, it's already hot. And then the apartments in there is really hot. Some of the building's hundreds of residents are trying to stay cool outside. Con Edison estimates their power will be back Thursday afternoon. Whatever food we do have, we did try to bring it out, put it on a grill so it won't spoil. I'm very angry. Yes, we, we are upset. We're hot and we are upset. Over in Greenpoint, where 1,500 Conet customers have been in the dark all day, the power company has been giving out dry ice. There are going to be sporadic outages when you have this amount of heat and humidity and that, this amount of demand on the system. Con Ed expects the usage Wednesday to far exceed last year's peak power usage. They're already reducing voltages in areas of Brooklyn and Queens. But the power company and City Hall are urging all New Yorkers to conserve energy, even sending out this emergency alert to avoid using energy-intensive appliances. This is very serious stuff. We need to ensure that our electric supply is protective. In the meantime, what's your message for Con Ed? Please, please fix the issue. <laughs> All over the country, as I'm, you know, looking at what's happening. Okay, people are talking about uh, heat waves, the effect it will have on our national grid, uh, the loss of power all over, and um, as well, you know, the power outages that are occurring already, 
from east to west and you know the infrastructure problems it's the infrastructure I infrastructure all over utility companies roads uh sewage uh drainage yeah you know, americans have been paying taxes forever nothing has been updated hello where'd the money go where'd the money go so once again if you don't know that man can increase temperatures really quite fast kind of like what we experienced here in Mon western montana heat waves already and all you need to know that it's temperature modification induced by man you know just this one one uh document here william gray he's the carbon dust man the black carbon dust weather modification by carbon dust absorption of solar energy okay the reason why i had to search for this is because um it's not available available on it's hard to find things now but I will link below if you care to read it. Um, just glance at it. Yes, they can increase temperature rapidly with black carbon dust. Now, does that black carbon dust need to be sprayed in your area? And then voila, you have that heat increase immediately. It doesn't work that way. In fact, I'm not quite sure how this works, but they can spray black carbon dust in to the atmosphere and they can, with satellites and, um, which I also have on that video, the, um, weather modification by artificial satellite, black carbon dust. So there's, there are so many ways in which they can do this. Weather modification by artificial satellite, um, and they can increase the modification the by heat. artificial satellite. Oh. I clicked on this thinking it would open. I'm very upset because I lost all of my, uh, I lost this thumbnail with all of my research on it so uh yeah modify cooling warming or precipitations of selected regions of earth um there's a whole lot that they can do but what they can do with just this black carbon dust is they can enhance rainfall uh the cirrus cloud generation well, they can make those clouds bigger and bigger. Uh, reduction in intensity of the hurricane's inner core circulation. Cumulonimbus enhancement. Alteration of extratropical cyclones. Inhibiting frost by raising daytime temperature. Accelerating snow melt. Yes, they can melt ice too with that black carbon dust. So, you know, it's unfortunate that we are living what we're living, but we are living it, so get used to it. And all the mainstream media, what are they talking? Climate change, climate change, climate change. Here's another uh, study that I cannot find. All I could find is this, characteristics of carbon black dust as a large scale uh, tropospheric heat source. Get a copy? Well, you have to pay. Of course, we have a tropical storm that will hit Barbados Friday a.m. Friday evening, moving on to San Juan Saturday in the morning, and Miami and Florida, uh, Tuesday a.m. 
maintaining its 60 mile per hour wind. Funny how we're now getting winds. Well, I heard this broadcast. I think it was in the, uh, uh, Indiana where they had 88 mile per hour winds. That's hurricane. That's hurricane winds. Uh, those winds are now developing inland. Well, that never happened before. Now it's happening on a regular basis. So let's just look at the satellite. Yay. Look at what's happening in Oklahoma. And all these frequencies blasting away at this, well, weather front. All of your nanobots activating. Nice, extremely low frequencies. All these frequencies on the coast. You must be getting an awful lot of rain. New Jersey, uh, Washington, Baltimore area. All right, I want you to see what it looked like um, on the 30th yesterday at 1.53 p.m. Mountain Time. So it was 3, just about 4 p.m. Look at this. Look at what's happening in Florida. Now, if anybody looks at that and thinks that is a normal weather front, um, you've not looked at satellite very long. I don't you started looking at satellite when they were using the nanotechnology. This is not normal. You got this nice frequency shot, Alabama, Georgia, but it just, it hugs the uh, eastern coastline of Florida. Look at this. It is truly unbelievable what's happening. But if anybody thinks that this is what, you know, our normal uh, Mother Nature weather systems ever looked like on satellite, you, you're, I don't know what, you just haven't looked at satellite. Look at this. Extremely low frequency. Those are the long ones, the long straight lines. But look at all of these nanobots in our atmosphere. So, it's hard, you know, just watching this over and over and over again. All of this glittering that you see, little blips of cloud. No. Nanobots. And yes, I do have the videos on my playlist. Um, few concentrate on the nanotechnology that they are using to create hell for all of us. Now, look at this straight line. If you want to know about weather modification, then please do the research. You know, many have on their channels. I have my playlists. Look at this. This is um, North Carolina. The immediate development of cloud. Uh, you see the air mass is going in different directions. Hope you did catch that. We're coming down north. I mean south. We're going up northwest. We're, we're doing something weird off the coast. We're, it's all over the place. All of this nanotechnology. I mean, I think everybody knows that clouds, they just didn't develop as little tiny bits of cloud in our atmosphere. So, it's truly remarkable. Look at this. 
straight lined severe storms. <laughs> well, they can sit at a computer, they can put in the coordinates, the data that they input into supercomputers will go to the nanobots. The GPSs will receive their instructions and they will activate. Nice pulse here. Not nice in terms of, it's just clear, right? This pulse is so strong, those in this area getting affected by it. By it. But there's, they're using these electromagnetic frequencies in a way that it's really, it's remarkable that we still have so many two-leggeds walking. And unfortunately, a lot of those two-leggeds are experiencing the symptoms of these, this new uh, electromagnetic frequency induced by man, you know, many living in chronic physical pain, experiencing an awful lot of symptoms from this uh, artificial world that has been created. No, this is not Mother Nature at all. Okay, well, it's life now. So this week, there has been an awful lot of destruction taking place. A lot of the interstates have been hit. When you, when you see the interstates shut down or mudslides, uh, whatever it is, think about our supply chain, those trucks that use the interstate. Both directions of I-70 through Glenwood Canyon are back open tonight. Good thing. After this weekend's rain sent mud pouring through the Grizzly Creek fire burn scar area and right onto the interstate. Number 7's Addie Guajardo joins us live from Glenwood Springs. And Addie, businesses are certainly happy the highway's back open, but worried this is going to happen again. And in Shannon, they're worried because it doesn't take a lot of rain to trigger a mudslide in areas that have been ravaged by wildfires. Right now, I-70 eastbound is flowing smoothly. I spoke to several business owners earlier today, and it was a mix of responses. Some told me Saturday was extremely slow. Others tell me that those locals that, were, that live here and work here and also the people that were stranded really kept the business going. Yeah, locals really need to help out local business. Um, so, I-70 shut down? Wow. All right, well, that cuts off a lot of communities until it opens back up. Um, here is Storm Elsa in the Atlantic. Okie dokie. So, uh, it's going to bring a lot of rain, that's for sure. Now, so many areas were hit. Kansas. This is Live Storms Media. I can't play it. I'll get a copyright strike. Look at this flooding. Peabody, Kansas. All of what I'm showing you is this week. Most of what I'm showing you is just the past couple of days. And the flooding. When you see flooding in this, these states, what I think of is the farms. Food shortages. How many farmers are being destroyed? And there are a lot. A whole lot. So this town flooded Peabody, Kansas. Um, here, Hilldale, Colorado City. Several homes flooded after flash floods hit southern Utah. Coverage now on that flash flood that wrecked havoc in southern Utah this evening. Alex Cabrero is live at the border town of Colorado City where several homes are cleaning up from the serious flooding. Alex? 
And Debbie, as you drive through these communities of Colorado City, Arizona, and Hilldale, Utah, you can see patches of mud pretty much on a lot of the roads everywhere. There is mud and debris scattered throughout some of the neighborhoods. In fact, right here, this is a bridge. There's a road that goes across the top of it. It was closed early because the water was high enough to go over the top of it. But for, for as fast as all of this happened, it seemed to go away just as fast. In a part of the state where it's easy to ponder time. Oh, yeah. Ruby Williams couldn't believe how fast nature was today. We haven't seen rain for months, but when we finally got some, it came down so fast that nobody was really prepared for it. In an instant, the skies over Colorado City and Hilldale opened up. The rain fell. And the riverbeds couldn't handle so much water all at once. Well, I went through the creek over here, and I saw the rolling waves coming through the creek, and I thought, oh, yeah, we're, we're in for some flooding. <laughs> and they got it. And they got it. In the city of Breckenridge, restaurant owner Mary Cowger of Sissy's was able to keep her business afloat after a flood in 2016. We were shut down six weeks in 2016. And we came in and rebuilt the whole thing on the inside. Although Calgar initially knew the area was a flood zone, she tells us it was booming business that kept her there. I just hate to lose everything. <laughs> yeah. Five years later, it's happened again. I have a lot of other stuff going on too, which is not good. So this just makes it twice as hard. She believes now, due to the city's new reverse osmosis plant. I could sustain a flood maybe every 15 years, but I can't every five years. And she says it wasn't until the new plant was built, turning her location into a drainage ditch. It's basically created a dam, which forces the water right on top of me. Besides and that is happening a lot, too. People are saying these subdivisions that are being built are creating flooding for other people. Um, that was Colorado. Now here, is flood insurance needed? Huh. Live to our Rob Tuke, who's in Odessa. Yeah, Rob, people are still dealing with high flood waters and you spoke with an insurance agent tonight. Well, that's right, guys. I'm told having the right insurance can save you money and the pain of dealing with expensive damage, but flood insurance isn't something a lot of people currently have. Like, dang, I ain't seen nothing like this since Louisiana and Houston, the flood. This area of East Highway 80 in Odessa looks more like a lake. Five vehicles got trapped, leaving drivers stranded. You can see at least one man wading through the water, which was up to his neck. There were even boats in the water to help those who got stuck. The water reached the windows of the trucks, even covering mailboxes and blocking off business storefronts. This is the Midland area of Texas. This just happened uh, two days ago. The mud slide in Springdale, Utah. Mike, it certainly looks a lot better now than it did earlier this morning, but this, if this is the first time you're seeing this mess, it does look pretty bad. This is the parking lot here of the Cable Mountain Lodge in Springdale. It was covered even in more mud earlier today, uh, if you can believe it. But then what they've been doing is scooping up the mud and pushing it out to those big piles you can see out there. And once it's dry, they've been scooping it up and taking it out. Of course, it is going to be a while before all the mud is cleared. And this weekend is typically one of the biggest for this area. It's normally peaceful around here. It's part of the draw of Springdale. Today, though, the only peace was in knowing nobody was hurt. The bottom line, everyone's safe. Nate Wells is thankful yesterday's rainstorm didn't result in any injuries. But the damage to his hotel, well, that's what really hurts. It's hard to imagine it being worse, but just the progress that we've made in the last 20 hours since this has happened. That's been, I think, the most amazing part of all of this. A lot of mud came through town, much of it ending up in businesses looking forward to July 4th weekend tourists after a year where so much has already been lost. There, there are so many people who, yay, we get to open our business and wow, the tourists are coming back and boom, they're hit again. Winfield Fire Chief Aaron Lee sent us these photos from the scene of an overnight water rescue on North Lindsay Road. 
Meanwhile, a pickup truck in the middle of a Lincoln County cornfield did not drive there. It floated that far off of Myers Road in the dark early Saturday morning. Once he got into the flood water, his truck started moving. As you see, it's a full-size pickup, and it, it, sw it wiped it off the road. Yeah. Missouri. Farmland. Arkansas. It's a farmer's worst nightmare. Fields of crops completely torn apart by flooding. Replant all we can, try to salvage the, the corners of fields best we can. Jacob Appleberry is a farmer in Tiller. He still has about 100 acres of fields still underwater. Some fields where the water has receded have to be replanted. We ended up losing about 45% of our entire crop. Um, there's guys that lost 60 or 70 percent. The Agricultural Economic Society estimates farmers in southeastern Arkansas lost more than $205 million after the major flooding earlier this month. Do you think Bill Gates' farm was flooded? All of his farmland? This is um, New Mexico. We are following serious flooding in southern New Mexico tonight where rain continues to fall. We begin in Eddy County where several families living in Carlsbad had to evacuate. Tonight, Eddy County tells us the evacuations are complete and evacuees are sheltering at Joe Stanley School. There are northern parts of the county that are closed and people are told to obey road signs. Eddy County crews are also in contact with Carlsbad Caverns to assist with evacuations there because right now only high clearance vehicles can get out. This new video shows how bad the flooding is. Canal Street Bridge is not closed right now, but the city of Carlsbad says it could be soon. Crews are out and will be keeping a close eye on bridges and rivers tonight. We are and... Texas. Our neighbors in La Mesa fighting through a devastating weekend after winds reached 88 miles per hour, leaving a path of destruction. These photos taken by Tyler Roberts' photography of what was left behind by the storms. Now, I've talked to several people out there who say there's actually a lot more damage than folks are even aware of right now. Tyler uh, saying every time he gets back out and as the water recedes, more damage is revealed. Tyler says when the storm hit, the wind was coming from all directions. He says he observed a lot of damage on the north side of town from the wind and more damage from rain and hail in the south area of town. But one common thread that doesn't surprise anyone that spent any time on the South Plains is how quickly folks came together to help those in need. Now, more pictures of trees falling on homes here. The incredible part, once again, you can see this tree so big and the wind so powerful, the concrete was ripped completely up. These pictures taken by Dustin Williams of a home on his street. Right now he's working to get companies like roofers out to help as local companies work around the clock. He noted that flooding is so bad there are entire neighborhoods that are still impassable. Last but not least, these shots taken by Joshua Morales of widespread flooding across La Mesa. He says he got these of the Boys and Girls Club. Actually, got out his kayak and started paddling around looking for folks who needed help. He ended up fighting, finding a family of five who were stranded in their trailer. He says he worked with first responders to get the family out. He says he's volunteered to help in a lot of disasters, but it really hits different now that it's his hometown. But just like everyone we've talked to, he says it is incredible to see how people are coming out of the woodworks to help. Now, he was also able to rescue several animals, get them to dry land. As you can see in those pictures, he is accompanied by his pup with her little vest on. Her name is Zayla, and he says she was a huge help. Okay, well, Odessa got hit hard. Texas. It's unbelievable. And the water is just sitting there. And you listen to the people in this area, and they need help. They need help. All right. Um, this is from the last tropical storm. What was it? Claudette? 
Northport mobile home area got hit hard. You know, you have to wonder what is happening to all of these people. Now, some people are allowed to go back into their mobile home because the authorities have given them permission at this point. But as you can see, there's an awful lot of homes that are destroyed. You know, El Paso neighborhood prone to flooding. No drainage system. What? Take a look at this house. You can see there is water and over from Monday night when this area flooded, but some of it is also from today as we started to see those afternoon showers. The owner of this house tells me that more water started coming in. Now I have a tape measure here. If you go ahead and take a look. If we measure the water line here, it's about four and a half inches of where that water was inside this den on Monday. And so what was your reaction opening your door and seeing the water inside your home? Well, I, I just didn't know what to think. Gonzalo Saravia taking us through his home where he had to pull out all of his carpet due to water damage. About that time I went to Home Depot to get that water pump and start uh, get it pumped out. Trying to repair as more rain hits his neighborhood. But That's another thing. More rain coming to an awful lot of places that have been hit already. Oh right, Detroit. I-94 shut down again for flooding. We begin this Wednesday night in Jackson Township. This is North Bailey Road, just north of Route 76. You can see cars stuck in the high water from the heavy rain late this afternoon. We also found FedEx drivers wading through the water. Their trucks lined up along the side of the road. They were waiting for the water to recede so they could get to the nearby FedEx warehouse. I just checked, and this stretch of Bailey Road remains closed tonight. Okay, that was Youngstown, Ohio. Flooding again diverts drivers off I-94, Detroit. Night drivers once again diverted off I-94 because of flooding. Chopper 7 overhead as an MDOT crew worked to clear debris from a drain at Barrett. Beforehand, drivers pushing through the water. This video from SnapMap. It's a reminder of the hardship Michiganders are experiencing in the aftermath of historic rainfall. Governor Whitmer, through the Deputy State Director of Emergency Management, requesting the first step for disaster aid from FEMA. A pre right. FEMA? Okay. Um, an awful lot of people are just ignored or they have to fight like hell. To get that help, the FEMA assistance. Um, but here, why it could take two weeks to reopen flooded stretch of I-94. That's not good for our supply chain disruption because you know what? You know, especially in areas like Detroit with all of these interstates that are, you know, connecting with one another. That causes massive disruption in our supply chain. Thunderstorms bring damaging winds and flash flooding. Pittsburgh. And home, listen to this. A number of houses in a Boardman neighborhood should be demolished in the coming days. The work is expected to help some of the flooding issues people in the Wildwood and North and South Cadillac areas have experienced over the past few years. The township bought seven properties to demolish as part of a project. Our goal for the remaining homes in the neighborhood is to move the channel away from the homes where it's adjacent to right now and create storage so that it will if it doesn't alleviate, it will at least reduce the flooding in the adjacent homes. The houses are all between Market Street and Glenwood Avenue. The project was funded through a hazard mitigation grant from FEMA and the Ohio Emergency Management Agency. All of the work should wrap up sometime next. Okay, does it matter where this place is? Well, yeah, this is in Ohio, Boardman, but this is what FEMA does, okay? The weather terrorists come and hit you, and then they hit you again, and then they hit you again. 
You can't sell your home. FEMA comes in, buys your home, pennies on a dollar, and then they say, hey, uh, once we buy your home, then we're going to raise it. But they work with local governments to do this. So the Boardman local government agreed to purchase those homes. They, they have to foot the bill for the smaller percentage. FEMA foots the bill for the larger percentage. But if the local town agrees to this or the homeowner, the individual homeowner agrees, the condition is they raise the structures. They demolish all of the structures, and they just keep it open. It's flood mitigation, so those homes don't flood again. Oh, man, if people understood how incredibly, you know, deceptive and evil are our federal agencies, what are they going to do anyway? You know, the weather terrorists are out and they're doing their thing. You know, they're not going to be able to sell their homes. Not once it's, you know, gone through a flooding repeatedly. So that's how they do it. You know, okay, now we're just going to raise all of those properties and demolish them. So, and, and she even says at the end, she said, well, you know, it might mitigate the flooding of other properties. So it's no guarantee. They want you out of these areas. This is Agenda 21, Agenda 2030. They want you in to those mega regions. They want you so destroyed that either you kill yourself or you have, how many farmers can move into cities? What are they going to do? I can't stand that this goes on and on. It just goes on and on. Europe got hit pretty bad. I showed you the Germany and Switzerland and Austria and here's Italy. But listen to what they say. A strong storm with hail hit the Italian capital in early June. The elements raged for several hours. During this time, about 80 millimeters of precipitation fell on Rome. The northern part of the city was particularly affected. The streets turned into rivers in a few minutes, the water in many areas of the center, and suburbs reached a height of one and a half meters. Garbage and mopeds, of which there are a lot in Rome, were carried away by the current. The metro had to be closed, and traffic on the city's highways was completely paralyzed. All this caused a storm of criticism of the current government. As it turned out, the sewage system could not cope with the water flows, since no one had cleaned the drains and wells in the last few years. Seems that that's a worldwide problem now. You pay for city services that just don't get uh, done. No one... Hello? Uh, no one's cleaning the sewer, the sewers. No one's cleaning the drainage for, uh, here in this city for years. All right. <sighs> okay. Well, people are hurting. I, you know, I still feel it's important to have a really big picture of what's going on. Um, because, first of all, it's coming to you. Eventually, it will get to you if you've not had to suffer the consequences of everything that's taking place. Um, but when you realize how many people no longer have homes, they don't have the money, you know, the woman in, in Colorado crying because she can't, she can't do it again, she doesn't have the resources, you know, to fix up her restaurant one, once again, all of these people who've lost their vehicles, who've uh, lost their homes, Detroit alone, thousands of homes got flooded. Thousands, okay? That is on the scale, you know, of uh, it just, well, years ago, you know, that would have received so much coverage and 
you know, it's, I'm seeing local mainstream media carry it. I think I saw a, a few mainstream, the national uh, mainstream media coverage of it, you know, within like the first 24 hours. But look at what's happening all over, all over. People are getting destroyed. What does that mean for all of us? Well, think about the farming and think about food shortages and then think about food inflation and think about supply chain disruptions. You know, it affects all of us. Think about the drought. Oh, that man-made drought, which they could easily you know, make rain. We all know that, but no, they're not going to do that. And then you got the fires and a whole you know, village is evacuated from uh, lit in B.C. And you've got, you know, towns that are sitting underwater, New Mexico and um, and Texas, you know, the western part of Texas, people are like being so devastated. And yes, I'm very happy that communities are pitching in and helping one another. But that doesn't make someone whole. They help out in the initial stages. But then when people don't have their home and are displaced, there's an awful lot of people who don't have the money for hotels, don't have family to take them in. So a whole lot of people are being made homeless. Then you have more homeless on the street. Then you have more, you know, people who are literally just being brought into a mental condition of they're not okay. You know, many people get angry. Many people get violent. Many people just get depressed. Many people, you know, it's like massive what we are looking at right now. It is so massive. And it's all over. And there's so much more to come. So, you know, the only thing that I can say is it is our job to mitigate. It is our responsibility, you know, to help mitigate the stress, alleviate the stress from people, helping out uh, wherever we can, being generous with time and energy and and money and yeah okay be safe everybody please I've had so many subscribers go down I don't want to see any more and you know what I know I will